Senate had been working on has been set aside. Congressional Quarterly reporting that senators could vote this afternoon on CIA Chief Leon Panetta to head the Defense Department, replacing Secretary Robert Gates, whose last day is June 30th. And now live Senate coverage here on C-SPAN 2. Pray. Gracious God, from whom all blessings flow, we lift our hearts to you in prayer, not because we're perfect, but because we're flawed human beings in need of you. Help us to find your judging truth, your cleansing pardon, and your comforting promise. Today, as the members of this body listen, study, ponder, and discuss, Give them special wisdom to sift and sort and filter the voices so that out of debate and decision may come truth, justice, and righteousness. Lord, use our senators so that your will may be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray in your sacred name. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Black. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible. Clerk will read the communication to the Senate. Washington, D.C., June 15, 2011, to the Senate. Under the provisions of Rule 1, Paragraph 3 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, I hereby appoint the Honorable John Tester, a senator from the state of Montana, to perform the duties of the chair on Daniel K. Noway, President Pro Tempore. Mr. President. Uh, majority Leader. Following any leader remarks, the Senate will be in morning business until 2 p.m. today. The first hour is equally divided and controlled. The Republicans will control the first half. The majority will control the second half. We continue to work through amendments on S-782. Mr. President, Americans have been very clear about where they stand on the Republicans' budget proposal. They reject it soundly. And for many reasons. But the most glaring is the effort to change Medicare as we know it. No wonder. It ends a successful program that has saved seniors from illness and poverty for more than four decades. Millions of them. Their so-called budget is nothing more than an ideological plan to shift the burden to seniors who can least afford it, an effort to put the insurance companies between the senior patients and their doctors. With all due respect to the ranking member of the Budget Committee here in the United States Senate, pointing the finger at Democrats as he has done will not erase the fact that they plan to end the Medicare program as we know it and like it. Democrats, Republicans, and independents feel the same way. No amount of political distortions or distractions will change that. Only when Republicans agree to take cuts to Medicare off the table can we have a serious discussion about how we can move forward on our battle to decrease the deficit. Republicans claim only sacrifice from seniors will balance the budget. We disagree. Yet they protect tax breaks from millionaires and billionaires. They protect billions of dollars in taxpayer-funded handouts to oil companies making record profits. The Republican plan would put insurance company bureaucrats between seniors and their doctors. It would force each senior, for example, to pay $6,400 more each year for health care, breaking our promise to seniors while wealthy oil companies and billionaires get a pass is simply too high a price to pay. We need to strengthen Medicare for the millions of seniors who count on it every day and preserve it for our children and grandchildren, not get senior benefits. Mr. President, I would note the absence of quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Kaka.
I ask that further proceedings on the quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection. Mr. President, over the past few weeks, Americans have gotten what seems like a daily dose of bad news about the state of the economy. Whether it's more joblessness, threats from ratings agencies, the price of gasoline, goods and housing, or a slowdown in manufacturing, people are finding very little reason for optimism. And they're getting little comfort from an administration that seems more interested in deflecting the bad news than facing up to it. Amid the onslaught of bad news last week, President Obama's message was that we had hit some bumps in the road. We had hit some bumps in the road. And that people need to be patient in the face of what he called economic headwinds. He even joked about the wildly mistaken predictions he and others at the White House made a couple of years back about the job creating potential of the stimulus. Well, I don't think the 14 million Americans who are looking for jobs right now find any of this very funny. I don't think that the 23 percent of Americans who now owe more on their mortgages than their homes are worth are laughing about their predicament. I don't think recent college graduates out there who are burdened with tens of thousands of dollars in student loan debt and who can't find a job are amused that the stimulus turned out to be a failure. In fact, I think Americans are deeply troubled by the fact that an administration which claims to be concerned about creating jobs has spent the better part of the past two and a half years, the better part of the last two and a half years, pushing policies that seem like they were designed to destroy jobs instead. Indeed, I think there's a growing consensus out there that far from improving the economy, the president has made it worse. The facts speak for themselves. The day the president took office, 12 million Americans were out of work. Today, nearly 14 million Americans are out of work. That's a 17 percent increase in the unemployment rate under President Obama. So employment is clearly worse. Gas prices have nearly doubled. When the president came into office, the average price of a gallon of gas in the country was $1.85. Today, it's $3.69. So gas prices have gotten worse. The national debt has reached crisis levels. In just the last two years, the debt has gone from $10.6 trillion to $14.3 trillion, a 35 percent increase from when the president was sworn into office. And his own budget projects that it will only continue to grow. So, Mr. President, the debt is far worse. Health insurance premiums have gone up. For more than a year, the president devoted what seemed like every waking moment to a health care proposal that he said would lower health insurance premiums by as much as $2,500. Instead, health premiums for working families continue to rise. And the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office says they'll continue to grow by as much as $2,100 per year. So health insurance costs have gotten worse. Home values continue to plummet, too. In my state of Kentucky, home prices have fallen about 7 percent in the last year, while new home construction is down almost 15 percent. I've got constituents with excellent credit telling me they can't get a mortgage because of new lending rules that have made it hard even for people who've worked for years and built a stellar credit rating to even get a loan. Nationally, home values have gone down 12 percent since Inauguration Day, so home values have gotten worse, too, driving down the equity people have built up over many years. Now, when it comes to policy, the President is fond of dividing the world into two camps. In, in, in his view, those who disagree with him are on the wrong side of history. Those who agree are on the right side. Well, at this point, I think most Americans would agree that if this is the right side of history, they're not interested. They'd rather have their jobs back. At this point, I think it's safe to say that the patience of the American people has run out. Administration officials made a lot of promises 
of a brighter future. They've had their chance to deliver. Americans don't have infinite patience. They don't want to be told to just wait a little longer when all the evidence shows that their circumstances and their prospects are only getting worse. They want a change in direction. You know, one of the liberal uh, think tanks in town recently issued a press release that I think embodies the disconnect between Democrats in Washington and the experience of most people outside of Washington. In the face of all the bad economic news we've been getting, this particular think tank announced that it had 10 charts which purported to show that contrary to the claims of some, the U.S. is actually a low-tax country. Never mind the fact that we have the second highest corporate tax rate in the world. Never mind the fact that nearly 14 million Americans are out of work. Never mind the fact that it, the time it takes out of work Americans to find a new job is now longer than it was during the Great Depression. And that since the housing crisis began, average home values have fallen more dramatically than they did even during the Great Depression. Never mind all that. These guys have 10 charts. They want to show you that proved government should take more money out of the hands of taxpayers so they can spend it themselves. I think this is all you need to know about the democratic approach to the economy. It never seems to change. Take almost any major economic indicator you want. Americans are worse off than they were in 2009. It's time Democrats wake up to this fact. It's time they do something to solve these problems and help the people right in front of them. Mr. President, I yield, yield the floor. Under the previous order, the leadership time is reserved. Under the previous order, the Senate will be in a period of morning business until 2 p.m. With senators permitted to speak, they're in for up to 10 minutes each. With the first hour equally divided in control between the two leaders or their designees, with the Republicans controlling the first 30 minutes and the majority controlling the next 30 minutes. I suggest the absence of quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
These past few weeks, I've been coming to the floor to talk about the size and scope of our nation's fiscal problem. It's been said often that this is the most predictable crisis we've ever faced, and I believe that's true. I've talked about how the tremendous growth of government has limited the ability of small businesses to create jobs. Uh, I've noted that uh, the severe and dramatic cuts that Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security will face if we do not act now to reform those programs now. And I've also pointed out how these draconian cuts would need to be paired with painful, job-crushing tax hikes. Simultaneously, the interest that we pay on that debt will take up an ever-increasing share of our revenue. In fact, it's uh, already been noted that in a few short years, the interest on the debt alone would exceed the amount that we spend on national security. In other words, we would spend more paying for the amount of money that we borrow in the form of interest uh, than we, pay, we spend defending the country. At some point, bondholders are going to recognize that we don't have an ability to pay out these bonds, and they will demand increasingly higher interest rates. This, in turn, sends our interest rates even higher, a vicious spiral. However, what I'd like to focus on today, Mr. President, is, is, is to talk about how none of this is necessary. So how do we prevent this from happening? Now, I think the solutions that we, that we need fall really into three broad categories. Uh, we need reforms to our budget processes that include, one, a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution. We need caps on overall and discretionary spending. And we need entitlement reform. In the 1990s, the Senate was within just one vote of passing a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution. And I can't help but think, Mr. President, just how different our country's fiscal situation would be if that amendment had been approved. We have two now different balanced budget amendment proposals put forward uh, this year. I co-sponsored both of them. I had the opportunity to lead a working group of my fellow Republican senators to discuss these proposals and to help find the best parts of each. From those discussions and others, we were able to come together with the Hatchley Balanced Budget Amendment, of which every single member of the Republican Conference is a co-sponsor. This important amendment requires the budget to be balanced every year, except for when there is a declared war. A supermajority would be required to waive this provision. This amendment puts the emphasis on controlling spending, which is the real cause of our debt and deficits. It requires supermajorities to raise taxes, and it prevents spending from exceeding 18% of our GDP, 18% of our entire national output, which has been the historical level of taxation for our country. Not only do we need to balance our budget, Mr. President, but we need to ensure that every dollar is being spent in the most efficient way possible. We need to be honest about the cost of this spending and to create processes that will prevent wasteful, unnecessary, and excessive spending. In order to do this, we need a number of budget reforms in addition to the balanced budget amendment. Now, I've introduced a Deficit Reduction and Budget Reform Act, and this has a number of reforms to the budget process that we use today. The bill reforms the PAYGO rules to prevent the double-counting gimmicks that get used around here all too frequently, and it makes the federal budget a binding joint resolution signed into law by the president, something that doesn't happen today with our budget. It moves us into a biannual budget timeline, which leaves more time for oversight. As everybody knows, we do, or are supposed to do at least, a budget every year. We haven't done one now here for 700, I think, 77 days. So uh, that, uh, the notion that we do a budget every year may be somewhat an antiquated one, but we are supposed to do a budget every single year. Um, because of that, we spend an awful lot of time going through the budget process, you know, doing all the appropriation bills, and it doesn't allow very much time for oversight, which is a function that we think, I think we have a responsibility to do. And so if you went to a biennial budget, in other words, if you did a budget every other year, if you did the spending, the budget and the appropriation bills, in the odd-numbered years, in the even-numbered years, when people have to go home to run for re-election, we could actually focus on oversight. We could look for ways not to spend money, but for ways to save money. I've been a big advocate of biannual budgeting, doing a budget every other year, two-year budgeting, for some time. A number of states do it that way. And I think it's important that we make that reform so that we have the appropriate time to do the level of oversight that is required and is so, I think, desperately missing around here today, which is why we end up having, I think, 
uh, so many uh, government agencies with so much duplication, so much redundancy, uh, and uh, so much overlap that uh, needs to waste wasteful spending uh, on behalf of the American taxpayers. And so the other thing that it would do is uh, my budget reforms, it would create a legislative line item veto. Uh, my governor in South Dakota has that, and I believe the president should too. In fact, I think most uh, governors across uh, this country uh, have some sort of mechanism that allows them to veto extraneous spending measures. Uh, I believe the president ought to have that power, and we need to be done, needs to be done in a way, of course, that's consistent with the uh, Constitution, and a legislative line item veto uh, would meet that test. It prevents the abuse of emergency spending designations, which have been used to pass hundreds of billions of dollars in deficit spending since the last time we passed a budget resolution. And it creates a new class act trigger so that if that program is not solvent, uh, over the, or so to make sure that that program is solvent over the 75-year time frame. Now, uh, you, I think most of my colleagues know that uh, the CLASS Act is a new long-term care entitlement program that was enacted as part of the health care reform bill last year. Uh, it, like so many other government programs, relies upon premiums that will be paid in the early years, which uh, lead to, to actually show revenues coming into the Treasury, which are then counted and used to pay for other things, in this case, the health care bill. But at some point in the future, when the demands come, uh, for those uh, benefits that people have subscribed for, uh, it becomes a liability. And because the, 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 the funds, the revenues that have come in to that program in the early years have already been spent, again, it leads to more and more borrowing. And that is what the Congressional Budget Office has said would happen with the CLASS Act. We need to make sure if that program is going to stay on the books, and by the way, I have, a, I have a piece of legislation that would repeal it because I think it's really bad policy, and I think it's going to put our country even, in an even deeper fiscal hole. But that being said, if it's going to stay on the books, it ought to have a, a mechanism whereby we ensure that that program is solvent over the 75-year time frame, and so uh, my legislation would do that. Likewise, it modifies the Medicare cost containment trigger to have honest accounting with respect to revenues and savings in the new health care bill. And it, it updates the Credit Reform Act to score the purchases of debt, stock, equity, and capital using a discount rate that incorporates market risk. Whenever the government gets in the business of uh, acquiring uh, debt, stock, equity, those sorts of things, and, and that hasn't happened, as we know, in the last uh, few years, it needs to be accounted for honestly by using real discount rates that make market risk a part of that calculation. And today, uh, that, that isn't necessarily the case when the, those calculations are made. It also creates a new standing joint committee of Congress for budget deficit reduction. Now, uh, it might interest my colleagues to know that uh, sometimes we forget about this around here, but we have 26 committees in Congress and subcommittees that spend tax dollars we don't have one that focuses on saving tax dollars. Now, we need a committee that is exclusively committed to reducing the cost of spending, to saving tax dollars as opposed to spending them. Uh, 26 uh, committees and subcommittees around here that spend money, it's time that we had one that saved money. So the joint committee would be responsible for producing a bill to cut the deficit by at least 10% every budget cycle and to do it without raising taxes. It would be a standing committee that would continue to fight government spending and would even issue recommendations to cut spending uh, by at least 1% even in years when the budget is balanced. Now, it's been a long time since we've seen that around here. That probably isn't going to happen in the foreseeable future. I certainly hope that it does. But in any case, uh, my, my legislation would require, even in years when the budget is balanced, that we be looking for ways to cut spending. Importantly, these re recommendations would be assured of an up-and-down vote in Congress. So this committee would make its, uh, its recommendation each year, and uh, this, my legislation would require expedited consideration on the Senate floor, in other words, to ensure that it gets an up-and-down vote and that it doesn't get languished somewhere like so many um, reports that come out of various committees. This committee would actually have uh, the authority to, to put a product out on the floor of the Senate and to ensure that it gets a vote. Well, finally, what my uh, bill would do, Mr. President, is freeze and cap spending, the third action we need to take in order to get spending under control. Uh, this bill would institute a 10-year spending freeze at 2008 levels adjusted for inflation. After all, between 2008 and 2010, non-defense discretionary spending increased by 24 percent, while inflation 
in the overall economy was just over 2 percent. So the federal government in the last couple of years, between 2008 and 2010, was spending at literally over 10 times the rate of inflation. Now how can you go to the American taxpayer with a straight face and explain that? So we need to go back to those 2008 levels and, uh, and, and freeze it there, cap it in there, and, and then allow for adjustments for inflation. But uh, let's go back and, and negate this 24 percent increase that we've seen just in the last couple of years. Now the recent continuing resolution that was passed by Congress started to put downward pressure on these accounts, but more needs to be done. Uh, my colleagues, Senators Corker and McCaskill, have introduced what they call the CAP Act, which would put our spending on a downward glide, glide path so that we don't spend more than our historical average of 20.6 percent of GDP. For the last 40 years, Mr. President, um, we have averaged, spending on the federal government has averaged 20.6 percent of our total economy. So that's, that, that represents all of federal spending. That doesn't represent state and local government spending, but federal spending uh, percentage-wise on average for the past 40 years has equaled 20.6 percent of our entire economic output. Well, this year we are in the 24 to 25 percent range. So now we have gone from spending a fifth of our entire economy on the federal government to spending about a fourth of our entire government or our, our entire economy on the government. That to me is something that needs to be reined in. Uh, we've been a huge ramp up in spending as a percentage of our entire economy. What that means is that the private, private economy as a percentage of our whole economy is getting smaller and, and the, uh, the government spending, the government component of that is getting larger. And we, should, we need to get that back on a more historical and what should be a realistic course. So there are at least at three different possible proposals to cap spending. The 18 percent included in the Constitutional Amendment, the CAP Act, which I just mentioned, and my own proposal to cap discretionary spending. These caps are necessary to signal to the markets that we are serious about cutting spending. Finally, Mr. President, we need entitlement reform. The CAP Act and the 18 percent cap would both force us to deal with entitlements. Now, I am heartened by the budget working group that's being led by Vice, Vice President Biden and that they are considering some entitlement reforms. And I hope that they can produce a product that actually will tackle entitlements. And, and we really need to have, at the end of the day, the president leading on this. Now, this group that's been put together, I hope will, uh, will, as I said, produce a result that will take us down a path toward uh, tackling uh, runaway entitlement programs. But we are, we've got to have, at the end of the day, and for any of this to be accomplished, for any of this to get signed or get enacted, we have to have the president stepping in and providing leadership. And so far, Mr. President, we have not seen that. The president, in his budget that he submitted to Congress and a subsequent budget speech that he made, uh, has done little, if anything, to deal with the issue of entitlement reform. And frankly, you cannot, you cannot deal with the fiscal uh, problems that this country faces, the challenge that we, faces, that we face, uh, or the deep hole that we're in when it comes to getting on a more sustainable course for the future without taking on entitlement reform. The President needs to be explaining to Americans the need for entitlement reform and showing us what his plan is to save Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, not simply getting out and, and demagoguing Chairman Ryan's budget and kicking the can further down the road. We know that these entitlements already represent 61.6 trillion dollars in unfunded liabilities. There is no more road. We have kicked the can as far as we can. It is now time for us to, uh, to face the reality that we have to deal with this and we can't afford the luxury of waiting any longer. It is clear that action needs to be taken. And if the President were to step up to the plate, I think he'd, we'd have a real chance to enact substantial entitlement reforms that could preserve the important role that these programs play. So enacting these three different prongs, or these three different approaches, Mr. President, one dealing with budget reforms that include a uh, balanced budget amendment being the, f the first component, uh, spending caps being the second component on both uh, discretionary and overall spending, and entitlement reform, those are not going to be easy things to do. And we've been on autopilot around here for a long time, and what that has gotten us is deeper and deeper into a fiscal hole to the point that today we are at $14 trillion in debt, meaning that we're going to have to raise the debt limit here in the very near future, and growing by the day. And the amount that it grows by the day, interestingly enough, is $4 billion. 
Uh, we will borrow between this time and uh, 1040 tomorrow another $4 billion that we will add to our children's debt. Now, that represents more than we spend in my home state of South Dakota for an entire year. $4 billion, the amount that we borrow every single, every single day at the federal level, exceeds the amount that the state of South Dakota spends in an entire year. That is the dimension of the problem that we were dealing with. Now, I think there are, I always say there are three really important numbers that I think people need to, to focus on to just remind ourselves how critical it is that we act. Uh, one is 42. That's the cents out of every dollar that we borrow. At 42 cents out of every dollar that this government borrows today, or this government spends today, is borrowed. That is a staggering statistic. Uh, the other number is 93. 93 is, is the number now that represents the percentage of our entire economic output that is represented by our gross debt. In other words, our debt to GDP, our debt to total economic output ratio is 93 percent. That's the danger zone. Uh, research, historical research has, has shown and demonstrated that when you get a debt to GDP ratio that exceeds 90 percent, that you are losing one percentage point of economic growth every single year. And one percentage point of economic growth translates into a million lost jobs. So every year that we continue on this path of sustaining this level of debt as a percentage of our entire economic output, we are, we are bleeding a million jobs in our economy. It's costing us one percentage point of economic growth. That is a very real and immediate impact from the amount of spending and the amount of debt that we have. And the final number that I think is important for people to understand, too, and that's the number I mentioned earlier, Mr. President, and that is the 777 number, because that's the number of days it's been since Congress has passed a budget. Now, I know that it's uh, very hard around here, particularly in circumstances like we're in, to find consensus on a path forward when it comes to a budget. But we have a responsibility to the American taxpayers when we are spending literally 3.7 to 3.8 trillion dollars every single year to at least let them know how we're going to spend their money. We, don't, we haven't done a budget here in 777 days. Now, uh, I've served on the budget committee. We have not had a markup. There is no uh, indication that we will have a markup. There's no indication that we're going to do a budget. We've already blown past all the deadlines that the law requires when it comes to doing a budget. Now, we didn't do a budget in the last Congress. And I think what that does is it makes it even more complicated to address these issues. Because if you don't have an overall framework, if you don't have a construct or an understanding of what it's going to take to get our, our books back in order, uh, then it's going to be really, really difficult. You know, sometimes around here we don't have enough teeth in the, in the laws that we have when it comes to budgeting. We don't have enough enforcement mechanisms, which are things that the budget reforms I'm proposing would try to cure. But, uh, but even with that, I mean, you at least have to have a plan. You at least have to have a blueprint, a, a path for how you are going to spend $3.7 trillion of the American taxpayers' money. And so I, I would urge my colleagues, the, 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 the majority, to put forward a budget. At least let's debate it. Let's talk about priorities. Let's have a debate. Let's debate amendments. But let's do a, either do a budget or let's reform the budget process along the lines of what I've suggested uh, so that we get a, a process in place that enables us to make some headway, to make some progress toward dealing with this runaway debt, these runaway deficits that are just going to crush, not only crush our economy in the near term, but put an unfair burden on future generations of Americans. Right now, the thing that most Americans are worried about, spending, debt, jobs, the economy, and they're all connected. Uh, the level of spending and debt is something that needs to be gotten under control to get the economy growing and prospering again so you don't have the federal government out there competing with the private economy when it comes to capital. Small businesses need capital uh, to invest to create jobs. When the government is crowding that out, it makes it more difficult. There are so many adverse implications, economic implications, from the debt levels that we are, that we are uh, sustaining today. Uh, it is going to make it increasingly difficult the longer we stay uh, deeper and deeper in the red for this economy to recover and grow. So that's fundamental to all this. Uh, when it comes to jobs and the economy, we also have to have policies that encourage economic growth. 
And I know that the, uh, the president has, uh, you know, talks a lot about jobs and the economy. Uh, he certainly is uh, rhetorically, I think, at least uh, saying the right things out there. But you've got to have actions that are consistent with the rhetoric. And if you look at the record, the president's record, uh, we haven't seen that. The reason we haven't seen that is because the policies are all adverse to economic growth and job creation, whether it's regulations coming out of agencies, uh, whether it's uh, the new mandates imposed by the health care reform bill, whether it's the out of control spending and debt and no attempt to address the long-term challenges that we face there, particularly entitlement reform, whether it's the new taxes that have been imposed uh, through the, uh, the legislation that's been enacted since this president's come into office. But if you look at the economic record, you look at unemployed Americans uh, since this president took office, we have almost two million more unemployed Americans. Unemployment rate has gone up 17 percent. Fuel prices, which impact everybody's pocketbook in this country uh, since this president has, has took office, have gone up by over 100 percent, over 100 percent increase in the price per gallon of gasoline since this president took office. The federal debt has gone up 35 percent. The debt per person in this country has gone up $11,000 per person. That's the amount of, that the debt has increased uh, since this president took office. Uh, food stamp recipients are up 39 percent. Health insurance premiums, despite all the promises about what health care re reform would do to lower insurance premiums, health insurance premiums have gone up 19 percent uh, since this president took office. Now, the only thing that has gone down, uh, Mr. President, since he took office is home values. Home values are down 12 percent. So that is the economic record. That's the composite record. And of course, uh, we can all say things, but we have to be judged by what we do. You can't uh, judge people by what they say. You have to judge them by what they do. And I hope that the president will uh, decide that it is time for him and for his administration and for his leadership here to focus on policies that will be conducive to economic growth that will enable that rather than make it more expensive and more difficult to create jobs, which is what uh, the policies that are being employed by this administration are doing today. And as I said, that applies to so many areas. It's developing domestic energy resources so that we can get more American supply of energy and, and start driving that price down. So many areas are off limits. Even more have gone off limits since this president took office. It means getting trade bills enacted. We've heard now for several years uh, the president talk about we need to pass the Colombia, Panama, and South Korea free trade agreements, and yet they languish. They haven't been submitted to us. We're ready to act. Uh, we've said repeatedly these are important to our economy. And I've used this example on the floor before, but just one, one uh, brief data point uh, for agriculture. I represent an agricultural state, and so we're always looking for opportunities to export. In wheat, corn, and soybean exports, we had an 81 percent share of the Columbia market in wheat, corn, and soybeans in 2008. In 2010, that had dropped to 27 percent. We have literally been locked out of that market because this free trade agreement has languished here in Congress, and as a consequence, other countries have stepped in to fill the void. And so now you have uh, the Canadians, the Europeans, the Australians stepping in and picking up the slack, and we continue to lose and erode more and more market share, which means more and more lost jobs in the American economy. So it's about trade policies, uh, tax policies, energy policies, regulatory policies, and spending and debt. Those are the things, Mr. President, that in my view will get this economy back on track, start creating jobs, create a bre better and brighter and more prosperous future for future generations of Americans. Unfortunately, the policies being employed by this administration are making it worse, and at least according to this economic record, much, much worse. We can do better. We should do better by the American people, and I hope that uh, we will find the political will here to do that. Mr. President, I yield the floor. Senator from Connecticut. I thank uh, the chair, Mr. President. Um, I, I rise to speak today about the fiscal crisis uh, facing our country and specifically the dire uh, financial situation of, of Medicare, which is a program that uh, matters so much to tens of millions of uh, senior Americans, but also uh, adds uh, so much uh, to uh, our national debt. And I want to talk about um, 
some ideas that, that I have about how we might uh, effectively deal with this problem. In Medicare particularly, um, w without doing away with the Medicare program, because uh, I believe in it. Uh, if I can start on a broader level briefly, it's hard to find anybody here in Congress in any party who doesn't acknowledge that, that uh, our federal government is hurtling uh, toward the edge of a financial cliff. Uh, we're now uh, running, again, deficits in this year of over a trillion dollars. That means we're we're spending um, a trillion dollars more than we're taking in. So we have to borrow that money. And um, at some point, we're going to reach a, a level of borrowing that is unsustainable. Um, one of the great, and, and, and will send us our economy hurtling uh, down, will we'll, uh, bring us into another uh, great recession, will compromise uh, our ability to provide uh, the security and services uh, to the people of our country that it is our responsibility uh, to provide. And, and to, to, to avoid that really horrific uh, result, uh, we've got to show some responsibility and work across party lines uh, to, to get some things done. Uh, none of this is easy. So you get almost everybody will say we've got a terrible financial problem here in the government, debt, deficit. But um, when you get to the solutions, uh, there's been an outbreak of what I, I'd call federal government NIMBYism. You know, everybody talks about NIMBY at the state or local level. Not in my backyard. Well, this is a great program, but uh, a great facility. But I don't want it in my, in my neighborhood. Uh, in the federal government uh, budget crisis we're in, uh, uh, NIMBYism uh, seems to be uh, not my uh, program or, or not my favorite tax credit. You, you can you can cut that other stuff, but not not what I'm in favor of. And so we've got one group saying n n no ta tax increases whatsoever, even indirect, through uh, the elimination of tax credits, which are spending money, and and they can be as wasteful as uh, tax credit can be as wasteful uh, an expenditure of of the, of the taxpayers' money. Uh, as a wasteful spending program can be. On the other side, um, we have people saying, oh, not my program. You can't touch it. Uh, you can't even try to make it more efficient. Uh, it's just uh, too good or it's too politically uh, popular or whatever. And, and if we keep going down that road, uh, we're not going to get anything done. Look, the, our, the main hope of a result here in the next couple of months is the small uh, bipartisan bicameral leadership group that is being presided over by Vice President Biden. And I think any time any of us come out and say, no, whatever the agreement is, you can't do this. It can't have a tax uh, increase of any kind. Even, it, it can't even eliminate uh, a wasteful tax credits. And the other side, people say, well, you can't touch Medicare, for instance. Um, it, it, one, shackles the, the hands of Vice President Biden as he tries to solve this problem. And it, it also means more generally that we're not fulfilling uh, our responsibility. And, you know, that's the case with Medicare. Um, the, the fact is uh, that those who say you can't do anything with Medicare, we just won't support it, uh, are not doing a favor to the Medicare program. Um, Congressman Ryan, Paul Ryan, Chairman Ryan in the House put to forth his own budget, including a Medicare reform program. I, I said when he did it uh, that I wanted to look at it in more detail, but I gave him credit for having the guts to, to put something so comprehensive out because it's going to take that kind of guts by all of us to save our great country from going over the edge of the cliff, from going into permanent decline, from making it impossible for our children and grandchildren and beyond to have the opportunities that we've had. <clears throat> when I looked at the Ryan plan, particularly on Medicare, I decided I wasn't for it. When it came up here in the Senate, I voted against it. <clears throat> uh, that was the case generally uh, when it came up here in the Senate in, in the vote on the Ryan budget. But you can't just stop there and say no, which is a popular vote on, on, a, on a Medicare reform proposal. I think any of us responsibly have to then come forward with our own ideas. And, and uh, 
Um, that's why last week I, I, I indicated in a newspaper op-ed column that I would be uh, putting a, uh, some proposals forward that will save Medicare, that will protect Medicare as a government program of health insurance for senior Americans, but that will change the program. Because anybody who tells you, oh, Paul Ryan's going to kill Medicare as we know it, there's another way to kill Medicare as we know it, which is to do nothing to try to save it, because we cannot save Medicare as it exists today. And uh, i tell you that the average, well, here's, I'll give you a couple of statistics. 2010, um, uh, the Medicare program cost $523 billion. The estimates that uh, I've seen are consensus, not extreme estimates, that within the next 10 years, uh, that number will double, double to over a trillion dollars for Medicare. Where are we going to get the money uh, to pay for that? Uh, that's going to add to the, to the national deficit and the national debt. Part of what's happening is that the baby boomers are coming of age into the Medicare uh, eligibility. Fifteen million in the coming years coming into this uh, program. Give you another general statistic, or uh, uh, all the studies I've seen show, most people don't appreciate this, that if I can say the average Medicare participant over the lifetime will actually cost the system and benefits three times what we put in through uh, 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 premiums, uh, withdrawals, et cetera. So this program is on an unsustainable course, and I think if you want to save Medicare, you've got to be willing to uh, change it. Uh, you can't say don't touch Medicare, and I must say I'm disappointed when I hear people uh, say that. So, so uh, here, here are some of the uh, ideas that um, uh, that I'm, I'm going to uh, that I'm working on legislation to uh, propose. Um, the, the plan that I outlined last week and that I'm putting into legislation, I think will extend the solvency of the Medicare Part A, the big program for hospital care. It will lower the federal government's financial commitments to the Part B program uh, for doctor services. And uh, most important, it will keep the Medicare program alive and serving America's senior citizens for at least 20 years. And when we get it estimated, uh, probably by a lot more. A lot of the proposals that I've made, and I have five key parts of it, uh, are similar to ones that have been made earlier and that the Congressional Budget Office has um, made estimates on. Um, my, est my guess, applying existing CBO estimates to the ideas that I've put forward is that this, they will save $250 billion uh, in the first uh, 10 years and extend uh, the life of the uh, program uh, by at least uh, 20 years, and that's 20 more years in which American seniors can depend on Medicare to help them pay their health care bills uh, in their uh, uh, senior years. Uh, so, so here's some of what I've, I've, I'm proposing. One, and it's controversial, but they're all controversial. You can't. You can't save Medicare without uh, doing some things that would make, make some people unhappy. I'm proposing to raise the eligibility age of Medicare uh, from 65 to 67, beginning in 2014, by two months every year until it reaches uh, 67 years in 2025. That would put it on the same course that Social Security is on now to go up to uh, uh, 67. Uh, that means if you turn 65 in 2014, you're going to have to wait an additional 60 days before you become eligible for Medicare. But in my opinion, that's a, a small price to pay for the guarantee that you're going to have Medicare to take care of your health insurance, uh, health costs for the rest of your um, senior years. And the reason for this change being necessary is, is factual. I mean, when the Medicare program began in the mid-60s, the average lifespan of an American uh, was a little less than 70 years. Today, the average lifespan is 78, thank God. But uh, that means that um, people are obviously um, living longer. Part of why they're living longer is they're getting better health care 
But that, that fact, that wonderful fact, means that uh, explains why the average recipient takes three times as much out of the Medicare system uh, as, they, uh, as they put in. Uh, I'll give you another number that uh, says this in a different way. In 1965, there were about 4.6 active workers for every uh, Medicare enrollee per person in the program as a senior. 2005, that went down to 3.8. The Medicare actuaries tell us by 2050 that will drop to 2.2 workers for everybody on um, Medicare at that time, and that means that the burden on those 2.2 workers is going to be uh, too high. Uh, the program, the current math, therefore, is uh, unsustainable, and it's why um, we have to change uh, the eligibility age. According to the Congressional Budget Office doing so, 65 to 67, will save $125 billion over 10 years. That's a substantial savings which will contribute, remember, that money will contribute to keeping the program overall viable and paying bills um, for uh, seniors. The other thing to say, and I'll just say this quickly, is that uh, for those who fear what will happen to those seniors between 65 and 67 as they wait, some obviously will have their own health insurance, but you know, we did pass health care reform, and that's going to be there to cover uh, those people through the, uh, uh, through the health care exchanges. Second, I pr I'm, I'm proposing that we reform the complex uh, Medicare benefit structure, which is wasteful, misunderstood particularly by the beneficiaries and a lot of the providers, and, and uh, uh, prone to over-utilization and fraud. That is, uh, taking more or prescribing more health services because you don't pay for it. Medicare does, uh, but we all pay for it. The, the Medi Medicare benefit structure is so confusing and so maligned with various, so maligned with various deductibles, co-pays, cost-sharing, caps, fees, forms, and limits that you'd be hard-pressed to find a Medicare enrollee that really understands how their uh, insurance coverage uh, works. As a result, there is enormous waste excess utilization, that is, services being uh, paid for by the Medicare program that are really not needed for the health of the individual. And that, again, means more, more uh, costs for the taxpayers. We can fix these pro problems, I think, by implementing a single combined Part A and B deductible requiring a copay on all Medicare services. And if we choose, we can also uh, do something new, which is create a maximum out-of-pocket benefit that will give seniors uh, peace of mind. In other words, that they would only be required to pay a certain amount, up to a certain amount, out of their pocket uh, every year. So that uh, guarantees them that uh, if they have a real serious illness, long-term hospitalization, they're not going to be forced into poverty or bankruptcy. Incidentally, that proposal was part of the Bowles Simpson uh, report, and it's a good one. Third, I think it's time to reform the premium structure. When Medicare was implemented, the premiums paid by the beneficiaries uh, supported 50 percent of the cost of the program. Uh, in fact, when President Johnson signed the Medicare uh, law into law, he noted that this equal contribution, 50 percent from government, 50 percent from the insured, was a critical part of the uh, program. And he said, and I quote, and under a separate plan, when you are 65, you may be covered for medical and surgical fees, whether you are in or out of the hospital. You will pay $3 per month after you are 65, and the government will contribute an equal amount, end quote, 50-50. Unfortunately, today, uh, as a result of uh, acts of Congress of various kinds, well-intentioned, Medicare enrollee premiums support only 25 percent of the cost of the program, half of what they were intended to when President Johnson signed this extraordinarily progressive and, and uh, um, beneficial law into effect. We make up the difference from funds taken out of our federal budget, general revenues. That's part of, the, uh, part of why Medicare contributes to the, to the exploding national uh, deficits uh, annually in long-term debt. So I'm going to propose that we raise premiums for all new enrollees in Part B, which is the part that covers doctor's expenses starting in 20, 
14, so they pay for 35% of the program costs instead of 25%. Uh, that'll result in around a $40 increase uh, in premiums. Uh, and uh, the fact is that uh, there is some indexing based on income in the, uh, in the Part B and Part D programs, and therefore, uh, under the current law, that the increase from 25 to 35 percent will be paid more by people of higher uh, income. I know asking anybody to pay more money uh, for anything is not popular, but it's needed if we're to address the stranglehold that Medicare puts on our annual budget and if we're to avoid something even more unpopular, which is the uh, demise of the Medicare program as we know it. Fourth, I think we need to reform the way Medigap policies work. Medigap policies are insurance policies that cover the gaps in a senior's Medicare coverage. They're designed to pay an enrollee's co-pays and deductibles so he or she won't be liable uh, for a big hospital bill if they ever get sick. But study after study have found that the Medicare enrollees who have a, a comprehensive Medigap plan that pays all of the deduct deductible and all of the co-pays so the individual doesn't pay anything use as much as 25 percent more services than those with the uh, traditional Medicare program. And that's because they don't have any impact for the util on themselves for the utilization of services. And again, who pays for that extra utilization of services? Not the individual Medicare enrollee, uh, the taxpayer. And it's not fair. And fifth, um, I think we've got to increase revenues coming into uh, the Medicare program. We, we just can't save it by adjusting benefits or making changes in the premium structure. And so I, I'm going to propose that higher income Americans, and in this case I'll define it as people making over $250,000 a year, contribute an additional 1% of every dollar of income uh, over $250,000 to uh, save Medicare as uh, we know it. That, that's the outline of my plan, Mr. President, I wanted to come and describe it to my colleagues, uh, raise the eligibility age, charge a more financially sound premium, address overutilization and waste and fraud, and develop a more reliable funding uh, stream so that we can save Medicare, uh, which is a great program, um, and we, which we won't save unless we take some uh, tough decisions. Um, I said earlier that uh, I think this will save, this proposal will save at least $250 billion in the first decade and keep the program alive for 20 years. I was really encouraged that the very respected Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget said after I um, disclosed this plan last week that they believed it would save as much as $325 billion over the next decade uh, and reduce uh, spending even more. Uh, in, in following uh, decades. I offer these ideas as a starting point in a discussion that we've got to have about how we can both extend the solvency and life of Medicare for the seniors who depend on it and reduce our national deficit and debt, which we will not do unless we reduce the drain on our national treasury that uh, the Medicare program now uh, represents. Uh, I'm going to be drafting this in legislation. I, I'm going to circulate it to my uh, colleagues. I, I hope it's of some assistance to Vice President Biden and uh, the leadership group that's working with him as, as they prepare proposals to get America's ship of state back in the uh, fiscal um, balance. Uh, I, I know that all of these are, uh, are, are full of uh, risk, political risk, but um, the refusal of, of, of different parts of Congress, different parties, to either cut spending on the one hand or raise taxes on the other is exactly why we're in the fiscal mess we're in now. And the more we wait to deal with it, the harder it's going to be. At some point, uh, there's going to be such a disaster that we're both going to have to impose draconian uh, cuts in spending and tax increases, and none of us um, want to do that. The way to avoid that moment is to do it now in a methodical and sequenced uh, longer term way. The, 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 the fact is that unless we take risks together, um, the great losers, uh, and those risks have to be across party lines. This has to be a moment when we say to each other across party lines, 
Uh, these are tough votes. I can demagogue this vote. I can go after you in the next election based on this vote. But I'm pleading with you to cast this vote, and I'll cast one that's risky too politically uh, so that uh, we can do something good uh, for the country. Because if we don't uh, turn away from partisanship and turn toward shared responsibility, the big losers uh, are going to be our great country and the, and the wonderful people who elected us, sent us here to lead it. Uh, I thank the chair. Um, I yield the floor, and I suggest the absence.